five. Shall we start, got, get started? All right, sounds good. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the IBM uh, online seminars. And uh, again, we're going to talk about our favorite topic. And the last time I remember that was EPR. Uh, today, we have Eugene Vasai, who's going to talk to us about the EPR application tools and kind of materials for batteries and how to analyze them. All right. Uh, uh, Eugene has come from the UK and is now working as a postdoc in Raphael Kremel's lab at Santa Barbara, where he certainly is going to enjoy for the next couple of years, hopefully, the wonders of uh, Santa Barbara, which is truly a slice of heaven, which was discovered by people like Mark Sherman and Songy Han as well. So uh, please feel free to... Uh, Oh, I'm muted. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, okay, yes, thank you very much for that lovely uh, introduction. Um, and yes, welcome to my talk today on uh, characterizing paramagnetic battery cathodes using multi-frequency and variable temperature EPR as well as DFT calculations. Um, so this is possibly a little bit different to you know some more standard EPR things that uh, are done. Uh, in that you know, this is obviously a very very highly paramagnetic system. It's not just sort of uh, more dilute spins which are relatively far apart, as you will see a little bit later. Um, but sort of before before we get properly started, um, I should probably give a little bit of an introduction to, to batteries themselves. So as many of you I'm sure are aware, um, batteries are an intrinsic part of our modern life. They power our devices, our cars, even things like our, our grid uh, transportation systems. Um, but there's there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in batteries in, in terms of trying to improve their performance, their, their capacity, the amount of energy they can hold, their lifetimes, and so on. Um, and this is something that many many groups have tried to to look at over the years. Um, so before we sort of get into understanding batteries and trying to uh, improve uh, exactly how they work. One of the things we need to think about is how do they work and what's the mechanism on which they rely. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with this mechanism, but for those of you who aren't, um, the lithium ion battery essentially works via this, what's known as a, as a shuttle mechanism, whereby we have these lithium, or in, in, if you're using a sodium ion battery, it's sodium ions, uh, and they are sat on the cathode in the pristine state. So before you even start charging or discharging, and through the process of charge, what happens is the, the, the ions basically deintercalate from the cathode, travel through the electrolyte, and they reach the anode. And th at the same time, an electron is released into the external circuit, and it does work. And discharge is just simply the reverse of this process, whereby the, the ions just transfer from the anode back to the cathode. Um, and really, the, 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 uh, one of the major bottlenecks to improving overall battery performance at the moment is, is the cathode material. The cathode is the thing that undergoes the most degradation and has the most uh, problems associated with it. So if we look in a little bit more detail at the cathode materials themselves, um, the kinds of cathodes I'm going to be looking at and dealing with today are layered cathodes. Um, uh, so these kinds of materials you can see on the right hand side here I'm showing. They consist of these uh, transition metal oxygen octahedra. So these transition metal ions are our paramagnetic centers. Um, and these uh, octahedra are knitted into these edge sharing layers. And then between those layers, we have galleries of lithium ions. Uh, and these essentially are, are where we remove the lithium ions from. And these materials are, are you know, very, very good. They're very, very uh, interesting materials. Uh, they have good high gravimetric capacities. You can get a large amount of energy out of them. They also offer very fast charge and discharge rates, as I'm sure you can imagine, because you just have a nice fast two-dimensional plane here for the lithium ions. And they're not just a sort of interesting quirk of material science. They are actually commercially successful materials. I'm sure many of you have probably heard of uh, lithium cobalt oxide, LCO, first used in the Sony, Sony rechargeable batteries used in uh, the early 90s. And also subsequently things like NMC, nickel manganese cobaltate, and nickel, uh, ma uh, nickel cobalt aluminates used in, for example, Tesla batteries. Um, and you know the, these these cathode materials are, are fabulous materials, but they are the overall limiting factor in full cell capacity. Um, and really, the, the the ultimate goal for for most materials chemists working on uh, lithium ion battery cathodes. They're, they're trying to understand a lot of these redox processes and these degradation processes. 
and a variety of different techniques have been used. You know, you've got X-ray diffraction here I'm showing on the left. You've got some X-ray absorption spectroscopy, XAS, in the middle here. And you've even got uh, one of my uh, other favorite techniques, NMR. Um, and essentially, all of these techniques are either direct or indirect probes of those transition metal centers, because those are the things from which the electrons are being removed or added to. So we need to try to understand how those environments, those paramagnetic environments, are changing as a state of charge and discharge. Um, and one of the, 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 the most direct techniques is probably something like XAS, shown in the middle here. But the only issue with something like XAS is that it's actually relatively damaging. I mean, you can imagine firing you know, several hundred, even thousands of EV at your battery. It won't really last too well. Um, so we need to think of alternative methods for, for characterizing these battery systems. Uh, and in this regard, something like EPR is, is ideally suited. Um, and I'm sure many of you, I probably don't need to go through it in this, this kind of a, a, a talk, but uh, EPR is, a, is an excellent source of understanding the local environments of, of paramagnetic centers. So it's been used in cathode materials shown here on the left. Um, where you end up with these very broad signals, and you'll see those a little later on. But it's even been used, for example, to, to look at the, the local microstructure of things like lithium metal and try to understand how dendrites form and how they grow. Um, and so really the, 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 the ultimate question uh, comes from, from EPR with, with a lot of these kinds of systems. All of the studies are relatively qualitative. You know, you can't get masses of information from a stupidly broad signal so far anyway. Um, and even interpreting some of these relatively sharper signals is also somewhat challenging, made, made challenging by the fact that you have both dispersion and absorption components. And so the question sort of arises, can we be more quantitative with this? Um, and this was something, uh, this is a question that I started asking uh, during my PhD and trying to understand uh, EPR as applied to, to paramagnetic battery cathodes. And really the, the, the first thing you sort of go away and you think about when you when you sort of deal with these kinds of systems is you need to try and find some sort of model compound. You need to find something which is ideally suited uh, to EPR and that is relatively straightforward to understand. Um, so how do you go about choosing such a model system? Well, you obviously need a fairly well characterized magnetic and chemical structure. And you probably want to have just one single oxidation state of just one single paramagnetic center. The reason being that we don't want to have lots and lots of different signals and we have no idea where any of them come from. So just having one center makes life uh, a little bit simpler, certainly makes the spectra a little easier. Um, and obviously we want to actually have easy to observe EPR spectra. Um, and in this regard, this is the material I've been choosing. So this, this material here on the, on the right hand side, uh, is known as Li2MnO3. So it is a layered cathode where essentially we have these manganese octahedra, just as I showed you earlier. But now instead of just having manganese octahedra in these, these transition metal-like layers, we also have lithium ions. And these lithium ions are approximately honeycomb ordered within this layer. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a fairly nice, well-ordered material. Uh, it's been characterized by lots and lots of people many, many times over, uh, including myself. Um, and I've been away and sort of characterized the, the magnetic properties of this material. And these are all sort of consistent with standard literature values. So for those of you familiar with magnetism, uh, this is an antiferromagnet. Uh, it has a, a vice constant, so a net exchange interaction energy of approximately minus 45 Kelvin and a nail temperature of around about 36 Kelvin. Those are values which will be important a little bit later on. You don't have to memorize them. There will not be a test. Um, the other thing is that uh, we also see a, a, an effective magnetic moment of around about four mag uh, Bohr magnetons per mole of manganese, which compared to the spin only value is a relatively good match. Um, this deviation most likely arriving, arising from uh, EPR's best friend, spin orbit coupling. Um, so this is probably a fairly good system to deal with. It's fairly well ordered and fairly well understood. There is, of course, a caveat because as with science, there's always a caveat. Um, the model is about as good as possible when it comes to battery cathode materials. li 2 mno 3 does exhibit at least some level of disorder. Uh, and by levels of disorder, what I mean is this is the standard ordered phase, um, which has a space group of C2 upon M. Um, but there are also stacking faulted phases where essentially these transition metal layers are offset relative to one another. Uh, and this has a, a different space group. It has a subtly different uh, structure around the, the manganese centers. Um, but locally, the, it is more or less more or less the same. 
Um, and another type of defect we can also get are lithium vacancy swaps, uh, whereby you, uh, sorry, lithium manganese swaps, where essentially these ions should swap positions. And it's thought that those kinds of defects contribute to poor electrochemical performance. So I, really, I suppose the, the main fairly simple question for me to ask is, is there some way we can identify these defects and can we quantify them? Um, so the first thing I went away and did was obviously I started out with just some nice and simple X-band EPR, sort of the bread and butter for most EPR spectroscopists. Um, so this is just variable temperature work, working between 5 and 290 Kelvin. And there's a few different things we can immediately see, um, just starting relatively qualitatively and being something of a paradox saying I didn't work, want to work too qualitatively, but we're going to start qualitative. And the first thing you can see is that we see a decrease in intensity and an increase in line width as we go down in temperature. So as we work from 290 down to 5, you see this decrease in intensity and an increase in the line width. And the second thing we notice, and this is somewhat harder to plot, so I'm just hoping you're going to have to trust me here, is that we see a sh gradual shift to the slightly uh, higher fields, which obviously corresponds to a lower G factor. So how can we go about actually sort of uh, interpreting some of this data in a, in a more quantitative way? Um, the first thing we, we can do is we can ex uh, examine the, the line width and also the interval of, of these kinds of signals. So I mentioned earlier that the, both the line width, uh, the line width increases as a, as a function of temperature. So as you go down in temperature, the line width increases and the intensity decreases. So starting with the line width, this is the kind of plot that we generate. Um, and you can see here that this is sort of somewhat reminiscent of that antiferromagnetic ordering curve and the magnetic susceptibility that I showed earlier. And this process is actually a fairly well understood process. Um, if you dig back into the literature, um, this is just a process known as exchange narrowing. Many of you I'm sure will be familiar with this. And the idea of exchange narrowing is, you know, this is the sort of the conventional picture for, for a single isolated spin where you just have these two uh, microstates given by plus and, plus and minus a half, just starting for a spin half system. Um, this obviously then rapidly becomes complicated when we add additional paramagnetic centers in, particularly the kind of uh, distances we have in Li2 and then O3, usually a spacing between paramagnetic centers of around about two angstroms or so. So we need to account for this dipolar coupling, this very strong dipolar coupling. Um, so actually we need to actually think more in terms of a, a distribution of microstates rather than individual microstates, um, which means that we end up with this very broad signal that we saw earlier. Um, but the picture actually becomes even more complicated when we then add on exchange narrowing. So when we think about uh, the exchange interaction, it works in, in a very, very similar way to zero field splitting. Um, whereby essentially we are now lifting the degeneracy, uh, the degeneracy of a lot of states um, and also we are now uh, introducing larger spin gaps between uh, individual spin states. So S equals zero and S equals one, just for simplicity, I'm showing here. And essentially what you can see is that we, we end up in a scenario where we have two possible sets of, of EPR active transitions. Um, and these are just shown rather qualitatively down here. Um, and in essence, the, the idea is that we have these two different transitions. So, you know, in theory, we'd be able to see both of them. But this exchange interaction term can be washed out relatively quickly uh, according to temperature. So if we go to very high temperatures, we would actually expect a greater population of the S equals one uh, state and a lower population of the S equals zero and vice versa, which means that essentially we have two possible frequencies at which we can have transitions, but their probabilities can change according to the, 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 the exchange interaction. So we essentially see sort of a, a hopping from, from one state to another, which is why we see this, this sudden broadening at, at, rather, uh, at rather low temperatures. Um, so as we cool down in temperature, essentially, we see an additional broadening, which is just an additional relaxation mechanism. Um, and one of the things that we can do is we can be even more quantitative. And again, this is working on a lot of the, the work uh, presented by, by Anderson, Bison, Kawasaki and co-workers. We can actually go away and model this using this rather complicated looking equation here. Where essentially this equation just says that at very high temperatures, we have uh, an overall exchange narrow line width. So if you went out to a stupidly high temperatures, you know, several hundred degrees, we'd end up with this exchange narrow line width. 
And then we have this additional magnetism term here, which uh, describes this sort of variation, this, this peaked uh, variation, where we have this important term, this critical exponent, which describes the type of magnetism that we have. And in this case, the best fit value we end up with is beta roughly equal to one third. And this corresponds very nicely to Heisenberg exchange, which is something we already know about this system. We know that it's a fairly nice system. It's a, it's a system in which we have uh, this Heisenberg exchange, this, this exchange uh, interaction that um, I'm showing just here, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, the other values, unfortunately, though, don't actually mean anything. This A and D, they're just sort of constants of proportionality, so there's not too much more quantitative information we can actually extract from these kinds of plots. Um, so, you know, we, we can get some nice useful information about the bulk magnetic properties of this material just by looking at the line width. Can we go further? The answer is yes, we can. We can even look at the integral. So if we look at the Q-normalized integral, um, the thing to note with uh, these kinds of EPR spectra is that the, the rather nice relationship between signal intensity or rather signal double integral and spin count is no longer valid, which means we now need to think about in terms of what does our EPR signal actually represent. And in these kinds of system, what it represents is the static magnetic susceptibility which actually means that essentially our intensity is just proportional to our magnetic susceptibility. So we can just go away and plot it in this fashion. And for the high temperature case, what we can do is we can plot um, and we can fit rather a, a curie vice law to the paramagnetic regime data. And you end up with actually a fairly nice fit to the curie vice law, generating a vice constant of around about minus 34 Kelvin, which is not a perfect match to experiment, but it's actually a relatively good match. Uh, remember here that we only, we're only looking at static magnetic susceptibility. There will be a very small deviation, uh, given that the true susceptibility is subtly different. Um, so this is very, very good. This is very useful. Um, is there anything more that we can do in addition to, to going away and just looking at line widths and integrals? And the answer is yes. We can also look at everyone's favorite, the G factor. Um, so if we go away and we just fit, start by, you know, just very simply fitting an isotropic G value to the spectrum. Um, what we see is this kind of a trend in, in, the, in the G values. Um, so what you can see is at high temperatures, we have uh, a certain G value just below two. That G value starts dropping away as you go down in temperature, and then suddenly it spikes upwards and it does a, a bit of a, an unusual looking transition. Here. And one of the things that falls out of a lot of the modeling that I showed you earlier, this exchange interaction idea, is that you can fit this G factor just to just a very simple thermodynamic average model. So this is just essentially Boltzmann statistics, where essentially we have two different G factors of two different magnetic environments. That's what G1 and G2 represent here. And they have some amount of energy in between them. And that amount of energy is related to uh, the, the exchange interactions that are, are present in the material. In this case, it corresponds to approximately minus 18 Kelvin. Uh, and this is actually a rather interesting quantity, and we'll come on to why this is an interesting quantity uh, in just a couple of slides time. Um, but the thing you can see here is that, you know, if we just fit to an isotropic G, we get we get an OK fit. It's not necessarily the best fit in the world, but we get an OK fit. Um, so this this kind of a, a model works very well for you know, the high temperature case, and it does a decent job, but it doesn't do so well at, at sort of lower, uh, at lower values. So the, the real question comes, where, where does where does some of those deviations come in? Why do we see those deviations? And we'll come on to that a little bit later on in the talk. Um, but before we sort of do anything else, I think the, the thing that I wanted to, to go away and do is, and many of you probably are sitting in the audience thinking exactly this, that this fit, these fits here that I'm showing, just representative fits, they are not, they're not necessarily the best in the world. So how do we actually, you know, extract any useful quant uh, quantities out of uh, out of our spectra. How can we say, you know, this this signal we're seeing here is definitely from our sample, it's not from anything else, it's not, you know, just some impurity or anything else like that. How do we actually quantify and say, this is the environment we're interested in? And in the, the NMR world that I uh, mostly used to live in, uh, I used a lot of DFT to go away and calculate NMR shifts. And so I felt it would only be right for me to go away and try and do the same thing with EPR. Um, the only unfortunate thing is that um, there doesn't really seem to exist the same kind of uh, EPR calculations for these kinds of highly paramagnetic crystalline materials as they, they do, for, for example, for NMR uh, shifts. So I've had to go away and do quite a lot of, of work on this. So this 
this current slide is uh, roughly two years work so please don't knock it too much i do cry very easily so um i will just warn you now that uh this is a hell of a lot of work just in one single slide so the the, the calculations i'm i'm running that i'm using cp2k the results i'm showing here just using the scan functional um, for those of you that are aware of those kinds of parameters, um, scan here used just because it's supposedly one of the most accurate types of types of functionals for dealing with a lot of these sorts of paramagnetic systems and dealing with trying to actually interpret uh, real world quantities that we can observe. Um, and these are the kinds of, of G values that we observe. And what I did is I went away and I calculated these G values under three different conditions. So a ferromagnetic case where all the spins are parallel and then two antiferromagnetic cases. And these two cases, they're actually genuinely experimentally observed for Li2 and O3. So the Li2 and O3 is one of these unusual materials that has a few different possible ground states uh, that are still somewhat under debate. Um, so the, the first ground state um, is, is this AF1 here, where essentially we have ferromagnetically coupled layers. So I, all the spins are parallel within one individual layer, and they are antiferromagnetically coupled between the layers, i.e. the spins are opposite to one another between the layers. So this is AF1, which is the one I'm showing here. And then AF2, and this has actually been later proven as the true ground state, uh, AF2 here is where all the spins are fully antiferromagnetic, i.e. spins within the same layer are antiparallel to one another, and then from one layer to the next, which I'm omitting here just for clarity, um, from one layer to the next, um, we see, again, antiferromagnetic interactions. So the thing we can ultimately see here is that we have various different kinds of, of G tensors according to the magnetic environment that we have that's present, which is kind of consistent with what we were seeing just a second ago. Um, another nice little interesting side note is that uh, we can actually go away and fairly accurately calculate these exchange quantities as well. So if we go away and decorate our cells with a variety of different spin configurations, we can go backwards and we can do some linear regression analysis and we attain uh, uh, a value of minus six Kelvin and if you remember a couple of slides back, I said that there was a, an average uh, energy gap between those two different G states of around about minus 18 Kelvin. And you can see this is just three times of this, uh, three times this. And the reason it's three times this is that we have three manganese nearest neighbors. So actually it maps on fairly nicely to those calculated values I showed you earlier. Um, and the other thing we can do is we can compare this to an average vice constant and the average vice constant we calculate is minus 47 Kelvin compared to experiment, it's actually a pretty good fit. So can we actually use these uh, calculated G values and can we match those up to what we observed at X band? The answer is yes. And again, we get an okay fit, not necessarily the best in the world, but it, it's all right. It's consistent with the kinds of fits we saw earlier. Um, and really the question that I, what I sort of then asked myself having gone away and done this is, is can we somehow do better? You know, we've, we've calculated three different G values here and we've got essentially a rhombic G tensor. And this is basically an uh, sorry, a, an isotropic looking uh, G spectrum here. So the question sort of arises, you know, how can we go about increasing our resolution and doing a little bit better? And you're probably already one step ahead of me. The answer is to use higher frequencies. So if we use higher frequencies, here I'm just showing uh, data at 255 gigahertz. There's a variety of other data that I have. Um, what you can see here is that we now see, rather than just one single peak, we see a heck of a lot more. We see you know, 10 or more peaks uh, in our high temperature, our paramagnetic region, um, uh, this spectrum here. And as we then start to cool, essentially what happens is that the signals begin to broaden. And again, as we saw earlier, they broaden even more as we start to approach this nail temperature. And as soon as we get below the nail temperature, things really start getting unusual and we just sort of lose all of our signals. They become very, very broad and they just separate out into really, really high and really, really low fields. So I had a couple of questions uh, having looked at this data. The first question was, what on earth is going on on these high temperature spectra? Because that's a hell of a lot of signals. Um, and then the second question, I suppose, was, what on earth is going on uh, in the low temperature region and how can we characterize this material even better than we already have? So um, this is uh, an example spectrum that I have uh, for this material at, at the high temperature uh, limit. So here I'm just showing the 220 Kelvin data, uh, 331 gigahertz, just to increase some of the, uh, the resolution that we have. 
And again, these fits took me a very, very long time. Uh, this is, again, about a year and a half's worth of work, so please don't knock this. I will cry, as I have mentioned earlier. Um, so the thing that we can see here is we have three possible environments in this material. Um, the first environment I mentioned to you earlier, this is just in sort of the bulk of the material. This is the manganese 4 plus in the standard uh, compound. So it's just the, 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 the non-defected material, if you like. The other possibility is to have manganese 4 plus in this stacking faulted uh, material where we have the, the, the layers offset to one another. And this is this P3112 structure. And then we also have this, this defect where the lithium and the manganese have just swapped places um, and this is a, the other type of signal that we get. And we can actually break these down fairly nicely. So we observe these three different resonances and we end up with a pretty good fit to our spectrum. It's not necessarily the best in the world. There is something funky going on up here. Easy Spin seems to be quite keen on trying to fit these three peaks over here, even though there's sort of one broad one. But I didn't want to sort of overfit my spectrum. So this is at the moment the best I can do. Uh, I am still working away at this. Out of these values, the, the fitted values actually compare to the calculated values. Um, the honest answer is actually pretty well. Um, the, this, is, this is not too bad a fit. Um, for the most part, we can get pretty good uh, comparisons, certainly for the uh, the two defect cases. The 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 main peak, this C two upon M peak, we see a, a, a few discrepancies. Um, the main reason for this, I'm assuming, is something to do with the magnetic interactions, and that we see a deviation from uh, from what is ideal. Um, but this isn't necessarily too terrible, um, and this is sort of you know still ongoing work that I, I'm gradually improving as as time goes on. Um, so I think you know this is actually a fairly successful application of applying DFT to calculating G tensors in this kind of system. And the, the thing I really want to emphasize is this has never been done before in these kinds of systems. So this is brand new work and it's it's really, really useful, I think, uh, to be able to characterize these individual environments. Um, and we also end up with uh, approximate values uh, uh, in terms of the proportions of these different in, uh, environments, which is consistent with X-ray diffraction data, which is the other fairly nice thing. So that's sort of the, the high temperature regime. How can we go about characterizing that low temperature regime where we just see this rather unusual broadening out of the peaks? Well, for those of you that are familiar with a lot of this uh, low temperature, highly paramagnetic uh, EPR, you are again probably at one step ahead of me. Um, and the answer essentially is antiferromagnetic resonance. So if we go away and record this at multiple different frequencies, we can see various different changes in the EPR spectrum. You know, we see some, some peaks appearing, some peaks disappearing, some peaks moving dramatically as a function of this microwave frequency. And you know, the question that I sort of ask myself is, is why do we see these sudden changes? Um, and for the physicists in the audience, I apologize, I am about to butcher your subject, um, but this is sort of my interpretation. This is a materials chemist's uh, interpretation of antiferromagnetic resonance as I see it. So for those of you who are not familiar, antiferromagnetic resonance is essentially EPR, but when you have a uh, an ordered antiferromagnet. So if you imagine to start off with that you're just a, a single isolated spin uh, contained in this in, in a paramagnetic matrix, and we apply a magnetic field H0. That spin naturally has interactions with its nearest neighbors, these exchange interactions, which generates an overall average uh, exchange interaction field, this H exchange. And in addition to that, we also have an anisotropic magnetic field interaction. Um, and this is H anisos. This is mag magnetocrystalline anisotropy, for those of you who are familiar with that. And the thing that we can do is we can fairly straightforwardly just vectorially add these two additional fields to our original applied field. Um, and this is just analogous to NMR. So for those of you who are familiar with NMR, typically what you have is you have an applied field and that uh, the electron cloud around a nucleus augments that applied field. So it's exactly the same principle. So what we can do is we can apply the same principle and we can go away and we can say, our overall sample field is going to be some quantity. And if we reorient ourselves so that we are completely parallel to this sample field, we now have to accept the fact that our spin is very slightly canted relative to that field. And if you have a spin which is canted relative to an applied field, uh, it will then start precessing about that field direction. And this precessional frequency is the thing that we're actually probing when we do antiferromagnetic resonance spectroscopies. So Kittel went away in, in the 1950s and wrote some very nice papers. Well, I, I admit they're very confusing papers um, to someone like me because I'm a bit thick like that, but there we go. Um, 
And he went away, he characterized the, the, uh, the antiferromagnetic resonance condition. And this was the, the lovely looking equation that he generated. Um, so there are a whole bunch of terms in here that we already sort of know. So this is our G factor, this is the, the applied photon frequency. And then we have the applied field, the exchange field, and this anisotropic field. The additional term that we have not yet seen though is this uh, alpha term. And this is just simply the temperature dependent susceptibility. So if we know what the magnetic susceptibility of our sample is, which we do because we've measured it earlier, then we can go away and we can actually characterize uh, the, the material even better. And we can actually try to understand, for example, this ani anisotropy field and this exchange field. So in essence, the way that you can think about it is that the field that we think we're applying to our sample is not actually the field that is felt by our sample probably makes sense. I mean, that's sort of the conventional idea with NMR, um, but this is essentially highly augmented because of this exchange field and this anisotropy field. So if we go away and we go and perform a few fits, and here I appreciate I only have a few data points. I sort of went away and did the best job that I could. I got as much data as I could, but it was somewhat limited. Um, so these are the, the, the frequency points that I, I ended up with. But if you go away and you perform a series of fits to the previous uh, to the previous equation I showed you, you can actually generate magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy parameters, which uh, is not actually something that's ever been measured, unfortunately, for Li2 and 3 but you can at least obtain them. Um, and when you do this, you can actually uh, see that you end up with uh, uh, values which are consistent with an easy axis along the C direction. So that's consistent with the overall magnetic ordering we saw uh, right at the beginning when I showed you what the, the ground state was, where we have these antiferromagnetic spins. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is that uh, very high fields, um, so these resonances are very, very high fields. This corresponds to a spin flop mode. Again, for those of you that are familiar, um, the idea is that basically at a, a very, very high field and below the nail temperature, our magnetization reorients and it, it basically it goes 90 degrees relative to the applied field, which means we see essentially a new type of processional motion, hence this new peak that appears at very high frequencies and very high fields. So uh, just summarizing for Li2 and Min03, um, EPR can reveal quite a lot of useful bulk magnetic properties that we can measure in other, other methods, but we can actually obtain useful values um, even using uh, just variable temperature EPR. And the high frequencies, I think this is probably the most interesting part, high frequencies when combined with DFT actually allow us to characterize those unique paramagnetic environments very nicely. And the last thing is that we can even obtain uh, additional magnetic properties that might be otherwise inaccessible to a lot of physicists, particularly at high frequencies and low temperatures. Um, so the very last thing I sort of wanted to, to talk about today is, you know, this is all very well and good, um, but I haven't ever heard of Li2 and 3 and there's an excellent reason for that, and that's because it's a terrible, terrible battery material. No one should ever, ever use it. It falls to pieces like a cheap suit, and you just shouldn't ever put it in a battery. So can we apply this to a real system? Um, what if you don't actually enjoy dealing with model systems? And the answer is, yes, you can use uh, this method for additional systems. So this is a material I was working with a lot during my PhD, this uh, sodium ion cathode material, which is actually a relatively promising material. And the thing we can do is we can do high frequency EPR. And again, we can go away and characterize two, uh, two or three unique paramagnetic environments in this material, again, consistent with uh, G, uh, G factor calculations corresponding to different uh, local environments according to the number of manganese three plus uh, spins around the manganese four plus. And the other thing we can do is we can obtain useful information about this uh, material in terms of magnetism. And here it, it turns out that this material is something of a spin glass. And again, we can use the high frequency EPR to obtain useful information about that. Um, and we can then even go, go even further. And essentially what we can do is we can cycle our battery and we can remove uh, the cathode at certain states of charge. We can essentially stop our cell, disassemble it at certain voltages. And we can go, OK, what do we see in the EPR spectrum? And in this case, what we can see is as we go through and we charge it, we actually lose a lot of signal towards the very end of charge. And this is consistent with essentially a, a very large spin gap between our ground state and these excited states, uh, magnetic excited states, that is. Um, and this is therefore consistent with a highly delocalized spin system, uh, which again is very, very useful. And the very last thing I wanted to show you, which I think is probably the, the neatest part of all, is um, this, uh, let me just get my pointer rather than showing you this. Um, so, oops, and I've now broken PowerPoint. 
one second, I do apologize. Uh, so, oh God, D, 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 D. Here we go. Okay, so here what you can see is what we're recording is operando EPR. So this is EPR whilst the cell is cycling. So we can actually go through and we can cycle a cell and we can actually see the signal disappear as we go through and charge the material. And this essentially corresponds to uh, losing a lot of the manganese spins because we're forming these highly delocalized systems. The signal gradually disappears. And then as we then start to discharge, the signal comes back again. We gradually, oops, no idea what happened there. Apologies. Let me just drag it through. So you can see here, the signal gradually comes back again. And then as we then start to form more and more manganese three plus, the signal starts disappearing once again and we lose a lot of our signal intensity. And then by the time we reach the end of charge, we sort of lose a lot of the intensity. Um, for those of you that are interested, the, the two frequencies to the left and the right are just Ruby references just to monitor the signal. The sharp thing in the center is lithium metal, sorry, sodium metal in this case, uh, which is obviously paramagnetic because of the, the unpaired spins on the metal. So really the question is sort of what do we learn? Um, EPR is incredibly useful for uh, providing information about local paramagnetic environments, as I'm sure everyone here knows, but we can actually apply it to these highly paramagnetic systems and obtain useful quantitative information, especially when we combine that with DFT. And we can even then apply uh, high temp uh, low temperature, high frequency EPR to obtain useful magnetic properties. So with that, there's just a few people I want to thank. Uh, I'd like to thank Howie for helping me to collect some of that operando data and Law for allowing me to use uh, her fabulous instrument at Grenoble for high frequency EPR, um, Claire for looking after me during my PhD and Raphael and Anton for looking after me now. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, the deduction of batteries, uh, the future of batteries for research for that sake, I suppose. Uh, while continuing, why don't we ask a couple of questions? So Oops. does anybody have some question? Please uh, either write it in the chat box or feel free to just unmute yourself and ask straight ahead. So while we are still thinking, why don't I just ask a question? So Eugene, a uh, quick question. So you, with the, you had in the one slide where you showed the microenvironments where battery was uh, in different environments and then you were fitting it, uh, you, where you were jokingly saying, uh, it took you like one and a half year and don't mm -hmm. poo-poo on it. Uh, quick question, when you, were, you had S control, you had the different environments isolated by itself. Was it fit a combination thereof of those? Yes, yes, yeah, it was, yeah. Okay. It was a combination of those environments. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Thanks. There's a... Any more questions in the chat? Hello, uh, hello. Hi, hello. yes. Uh, very nice talk. In fact, I'm very new to the EPR and recently I got some results on the uh, on the VT, uh, VT different EPR in experiment on the conductive polymer. Mm -hmm. And I found that once the temperature is get lower the sensitivity gets less yep. so i is do you know what this like indicates the, i the mean mechanism? if if you've got a conductive polymer if it's becoming a lot more metallic essentially you'll just have a greater dispersion so you'll lose a lot of your signal intensity uh, so it's invariable because essentially as you cool obviously the metal down it becomes more and more metallic it becomes more conductive so you disperse a lot more of your signal so you're probably just losing a lot of the signal in the dispersion i would imagine do you think be, because also the radical can be very delocalized in the in the yeah exactly so that that's the idea so it will just become more and more delocalized which will probably open a lot more spin gaps up within the material I would imagine ah, I see and also the other thing is when when I sweep the temperature and I also fear the G factor is also changed a little bit but it's very tiny yeah so do you, so the the a uh, G factor change, it, which is very, very small as a function temperature, I think is a, a, a fairly normal thing. The thing that I showed here, mm -hmm. that's that's called the, the extreme edge, I suppose, because it, it's a lot more paramagnetic. You have a lot more of these exchange interactions. So it, it, it's going to be a subtly different thing. Um, 
so it, it will vary from one system to another, but I, I would imagine it's essentially subtle changes in the extent of spin orbit coupling or something similar. Okay, so if they have like like two radicals at the same time, maybe they do some exchange. To, yes, to... yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow, well, it's very informative. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, Boris uh, Yafkin asked a question. Um, he was asking, why don't we see the manganese hypofine coupling? Excellent question. So um, the actual answer is that you do sort of see them. So um, it's uh, basically the manganese hyperfine is much, much, much weaker than zero field splitting or the exchange interactions. So the manganese hyperfine only really um, contributes to about, uh, say, a millitesla or less in terms of broadening. Um, so actually, it's basically absorbed into the breadth of the, the, the peaks, which is why it's so incredibly broad. So there's no manganese hyperfine interaction that we can observe, but obviously you would expect it. Um, I did also try and go away and do additional sort of fits to, because obviously you'd expect lithium hyperfine and maybe some oxygen hyperfine if you're feeling particularly fancy. Um, but realistically, you just can't see them because the breadth is just, it's too great. Great. Uh, Ilya was asking on, give me a minute. Ilya was asking, uh, do you see degradation of capacity in your operandum measurement? Do you have a two or three, and also he was asking, do you have a two or three cell electrode? So it's a, it's a two electrode cell. Um, and we do see a degradation of capacity, but that's actually just consistent with how that battery material performs. Um, other battery materials that are a lot more successful, so things like uh, lithium cobalt oxide or uh, some of the NMCs and so on, we cycle those and we do, we see just perfect behavior. We see exactly what we would see in a standard sort of coin cell or any other sort of cell setup. Um, so it, it, it's, it produces consistent with the uh, results. Obviously, we can't just spend you know, forever and ever and ever recording data on, on the spectrometer because other people want to use it and they would kill me. Um, but it's uh, to at least several days, so a few, few cycles worth, it's consistent with what we would normally see. Great. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Avaris, he was asking, can you extract ZFS parameter with your DFT calculation? Yes, the answer is uh, you can with uh, with this. Um, so here I have been able to go away and you can obtain zero field splitting parameters and those are consistent with the parameters that I observe. Um, the only issue is that in easy spin, what I'm using are the, the Stevens operator um, zero field splittings. I can't get that level of information. I can only sort of get more overall information. So I can only sort of get one single D parameter out essentially. Um, but uh, they are at least consistent with that. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so far, that's all questions. That anybody else has a question, please ask away. Well, with this in mind, I want to thank our speaker, Eugene Bessie. I hope you enjoyed your talk as much as we enjoyed it. And thank you. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Hope to see everybody again in two weeks of time. And uh, thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.